to a great topic on this evening, basically con continuing with second part of our series, or part two of our series, which we'll conclude on this particular evening, basically why I believe in anything at all. Before we get started, the first thing that I wanted to do is I wanted to give you guys a quick little shout out um, as far as our services are concerned. So our services are on Sundays at 10.30 a.m. And of course, we also have Wednesday night broadcast at 7 o'clock p.m. Um, it's, of course, a little bit earlier now because I'm a family man and um, my son has a football game this evening. And so I want to make sure that I um, continue to be a father to my kids, make sure that I'm in their lives. And even with in the midst of this whole COVID situation, um, ironically enough, it gives you a little bit level of flexibility because of technology. So I'm so thankful to God for that. So once again, services are 1030 a.m. on Sunday mornings. Don't stay home. Make sure that you come to the house of the Lord. Uh, we know what we need to do now. We know how to stay socially uh, separate from each other. We know how to wear our mask. We have enough space. Um, in the place today and so hopefully um, you haven't gotten too accommodated staying at home you can come on out and I do believe that the virus will eventually pass all right and so we're in a good spot we're in Seminole County very low cases in our specific area so come on out we would love you to see your face in the place there's power in fellowship and unity because we are the church also quick little shout out to Truth Learning Academy. Truth Learning Academy is located at 350 Anchor Road, same place as the actual church itself. Um, it's adjacent to our specific property, literally speaking, and we still have enrollments. Our enrollments are increasing, so make sure that you get your child signed up today. We have a lot of space for two-year-olds as well as three-year-olds, um, but our infants are basically almost at maximum capacity, and um, also our ones uh, I believe our ones and twos are almost at capacity. We still got about four or five slots for that. And then we have a tons of space for three year olds. And so uh, we're hiring as well. If you're a floater, if you're an assistant teacher and you have your DCF 45 hours, make sure that you check us out. It's going to be of the utmost importance. Okay. Last little announcement that I do have before we get into the teaching for tonight. Guess what, everybody? We are still, we are still in the process of doing things in the community. We have not stopped. We're going to continue to serve the things of God and also serve the people of God. So make sure that you also come on out and check us out in regards to our event on November the 7th at um, 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. We're going to be having our drive through food drive and turkey giveaway. We're going to be working in partnership with FarmShare that's done a lot of activity in our specific area. And we're actually one of the first ones to do it um, for the city of Castleberry. And we're going to continue that as we begin to move along to the glory of God. So we thank all of the people who are in the city who have helped participate in this specific event um, in regards to donations. The best thing to do because we're handling food and we don't want any type of issues in regards to the food, Publix gift cards and or when dixie gift cards are good and if you're really feeling high class and you really want to bless somebody you can always give us a um gift card to honey bake ham <laughs> i don't know how i don't know any other way to be able to say honey bake ham without laughing <laughs> but it is very funny to me i don't know i guess i get that from my dad all right because he likes to go to honey bake ham on a regular basis okay and no cajun turkey well if you get a turkey um and you get a Cajun turkey, get one for me um, instead, all right? No, I'm just teasing. Uh, trust me, uh, my wife will take care of me in that specific area and my church family. But I do like Cajun turkey, by the way, all right? So once again, don't forget that event is on November the 7th from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. All right, so now let's go ahead and get into it for today. Once again, we're going to be talking about why I believe anything, why I believe anything at all let us pray father we thank you for this time we honor you we bless you lord god we thank you for your kindness your mercy and grace we thank you lord god for your presence we thank you lord god for your favor in jesus name amen amen and amen so once again we're just so thankful to god that 
you are in the place today and we are also so thankful that you know that you've been able to be with us during all of these specific moments and times of going through covid um, basically dealing with things um, that have been very um, difficult um, for the people of god and so we just thank god for you we, we really and truly do all right so let me go ahead and get myself together and let's go ahead and get into the teaching for today all right so this is where we basically left off last time we basically were talking about um, the possible avenues to the knowledge or how a person arrives at the truth you may also see a nice little survey or a Facebook survey um, on your mobile device or even on your computer right now that basically asks the question how do you arrive at the truth now when you are thinking about a Bible study you think about okay where's the Bible at where's the Bible at well the truth of the matter is is that Theology is best formed in community. That's what I learned from my uh, spiritual father and mentor, Bishop Vaughn Monroe McLaughlin, and of the Potter's House International Ministries in Jacksonville, Florida. And we want to try to dispel some myths in regards to how a person gets to the truth. And so the, basically the question is a four-pronged prong question, or you have four different options. In other words, do you get to the truth or arrive to the truth based on what you see, based on what you feel, based on what you heard, okay or based on or or uh, based on what someone else says you know those still kind of fit within some of the same categories that you see right here um, online so let me go ahead and get my nice little pen out because I love interaction and I love teaching and so each one of those specific questions surround themselves around uh, what you see right here empiricism is basically what I see subjectivism basically on how I feel rationalism how I think and how I process things and then of course th authoritarianism which is basically based on what someone else says if they if someone else says it then and therefore it has to be true and so we want to make sure that we understand those things as we move forward okay so now what about the next phase so the next phase basically entails a couple of the following number one let's go ahead and look at what David Hume says now who is this gentleman right here? Who, what does he um, have to do with anything? Well, David Hume is actually the father of scientism, okay? Basically meaning that he was really about um, empirical knowledge. Empiricism is a big fancy word for, I won't believe it unless I see it. I have to look at the data, facts and figures, and that actually has its place. But that is not the only way to acquire the truth. Or get to the truth so David Hume says if we take in our hand any volume of divinity or schools metaphysics for instance let us ask does it contain any abstract reasoning concerning quantity or number no does it contain any experimental reasoning concerning matter of fact and existence no commit it then to the flames for it can contain nothing but sophistry and illusion Wow that is pretty uh, pretty devastating commentary right there but the truth of the matter is is that that is exactly how a lot of people actually believe especially when it comes to specific topics um, regarding to the actual truth if I don't see it I can't believe it if I can't quantifiably measure it like how can I measure the existence of God well some people believe that it's just spiritual only no the existence of God and the the truth of the scriptures the truth of Jesus Christ um, it's actually expressed in many of the four areas that um, I've talked about previously. Not only based on what you see, documented evidence, not only based on what you heard, eyewitness testimony, think about the 500 witnesses that saw the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Also innately, that it has to make sense within your mind and in your heart. That's where the transformation at the heart takes place and it's just something that you know. That's the reason why you can have somebody that may not be as um, educated or you know in the halls of academia going to Yale Divinity School or Princeton but they are still safe and they have the um, actions to also correspond along with that so that is also very important for you to basically understand and ascertain along with that we also know that not only should you see that the scriptures have things that you can see archaeology Things that you can feel, the Holy Spirit, things that make sense, logical deduction. Um, if you want a quick little homework note, look up the Golden Chain 
of redemption, which is basically Paul's um, process uh, or even Romans wrote. And it basically systematically goes down logically how the gospel makes sense and how mankind fits within the plan of, of God and how the scriptures point that out in a very distinct way. How about A.J. Ayers? A.J. Ayers, who is also a hard view and has a hard view of empiricism, he also says this says the following. Is the truth claim a tautology? Is the truth claim empirically verifiable? If not, then it's meaningless and emotive at best. In other words, it's all about emotion. All God talk is meaningless. Once again, these are things that people basically battle with. Now, even if you don't battle with these areas, sometimes you may have thoughts that come across your mind. And so whenever you are or have certain types of thoughts that may um, come against the certain things that you may have learned or even certain things that within your spirit that you actually know, you have to know that that is the uh, work of the enemy, meaning that he wants you to doubt that God said what he said. It goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Are you sure that God told you not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Are you sure he said that? Are you sure he really meant that? I mean, there has to be some wiggle room. It's almost like a forked tongue um, individual who likes to tell the truth and the lie at the same time, which is still a lie. And so these are just some of the other um, thought processes that basically come into play. So we have a question at this particular junction. What is the question? Well, we need to ask the question, is scientism valid? In other words, is your only way, is the only way that you believe things based off of science? But notice how it says scientism versus science. There is science, which is, you know, basically extracting data or learning about things that um, are in this world, this natural 4D world, you know, height, width, depth, sound, you know, um, vision, touch, all of these different types of things that we experience as humans in this world, from the universe all the way to our um, innate selves. So there are some great elements in regards to science, but then there is a almost cult-like thrust in regards to science where it begins to go beyond science and into okay everything must be seen through the lens of science as if the scientists are a deity or they have the authority to be able to speak about philosophical matters and things or matters of the heart talk about love if you talk about love in the view or through the lens of scientists it basically will relegate it down to chemicals bonds more animalistic type of behavior or instincts but nothing could be farther from the truth we are made in the image and likeness of the of god and so even as you look at this quote both hume here's the conclusion both hume and air statements are what we would call self-defeating in other words when someone says we should only believe what science can prove that is a philosophical statement that cannot be proven by science empiricism is not ruled out as a means for determining the truth but it does have its limits. How can you measure faith? How can you measure effort? How can you measure sincerity? How can you measure the depth of a person's um, feelings for another? How about love? How about a love that a mother has for a child? Why do people do evil things? Um, these are things that science cannot answer. Science can only answer a part of the equation. They only have a couple of mechanisms inside of the watch, but they do not have the totality of the watch, nor do they understand or how to quantify the watchmaker themselves. Now let's go ahead and move on a little bit. So basically the bottom line is, is that you can have other methods to basically determine the truth. For example, you have to look at things through a process of elimination. There are certain types of tests that can be appropriate as you go through the realm of truth. And so, again, going through those different ways, looking and seeing things for yourself, evidence, reading books, going to the library, looking at archaeological finds. And you would be amazed at how many people look at archaeological finds they from, come from out of the land of Israel or from out of the Middle East that are biblically sound, like the Muratorian fragment, like uh, the signet ring from King Hezekiah, um, talking about different types of references in different books from Josephus and Tacitus and Pliny the Younger and Ignatius, all these individuals who are around during the first century that actually wrote about Jesus Christ. And this is outside of the actual biblical text because sometimes 
people who don't believe in the scriptures, they will look at the biblical text and say, well, tell me something that um, you can find outside of the Bible. And then you'd be uh, amazed to find out that when you give them resources outside of the Bible, it's still dismissed anyway. So it's not really that. Now, the, the hope is, is that even if somebody dismisses something like that initially, it does not mean that it will not penetrate their heart at a later time. Now, here's another piece, too. Just because you go through facts and figures and statistics and um, even as I go through Bible study today, there's nothing that trumps the gospel. So my attempt for you today is to is for really for a specific audience, an audience that struggles with things that um, have been created from their mind. What we would call like to call this, uh, biblically speaking, is called a stumbling block. So there are certain stumbling blocks that have been penetrated the minds of humans because of what they heard and definitely what they have seen on social media. And then they arrive at um, certain types of conclusions, sometimes based off the law of first truth. Law of first truth is basically that's how I've always done it. That's how I was taught. That's how I grew up. And therefore, it must be the truth because, you know, that was the first thing. And I live my life by that way. What other ways are there? But we need to understand that there are other methods to arrive to the truth. Matter of fact, about four of them. And so what does the Bible say about these specific things? Well, in regards to subjectivism, rationalism, empiricism, and then, of course, testimony. So in regards to biblical methods on gaining knowledge. Now, this is where we get into the scriptures, right? Romans chapter 2, verse 14 says, For when the Gentiles do not have the law, do instinctively the things of the law. These, not having the law, are a law to themselves. Okay, so this is subjectivism. In other words, people who are not believers still follow God's law. They call it or put into the category of morality. And they would say something like, I don't have to believe in the Bible in order to know right from wrong. But the scripture says, just like you see right here in the book of Romans, and Romans was a letter that was written by Paul to people who really thought this way. They were in a very paganistic type of society filled with atheists, filled with agnostic people, primarily agnostic people, uh, more so than atheists even at that moment in time. And so you would have individuals that would say certain things like that. But the scriptures say that, hey, um, you have been imprinted by God to know right from wrong. In other words, the law is written on our hearts. So that's subjectivist. In other words, you know this innately, even without a Bible. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean that you should stop there. It just means that that is a beginning point. Okay. Next piece, authoritarianism. And this is come from out of John chapter 20, verse 30 through 31. And it says, therefore, many other signs were also performed in the presence of the disciples. So let me go ahead and um, clear, clear this out quickly. Okay. So many other things were actually performed in regards to the actual disciples or many other signs are also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So when we look at that, we're looking at authoritarianism. Now, it doesn't mean authoritarianism as in like a tyrannical dictator or anything like that. That's not what Pastor Martin is saying. What Pastor Martin is saying is that a testimony is an authoritative uh, source of it's authoritative source of information. OK. And then finally, we also have rationalism. Rationalism, of course, comes from out of Acts chapter 17, verse 2, which says, And according to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures. So you see in area number one at the very top right here, subjectivism. OK. Area number two right here, authoritarianism. And then area number three, rationalism. So this one at the very top, you can say, and I'm just going to put this as an HS. This is what we are governed by. Those of us who are saved, we're governed by the Holy Spirit that amplifies the design of God, which in the beginning was meant to basically follow the voice of God. That voice is diminished because of sin. But when you have the Holy Spirit, God's voice is amplified. But if you're not saved, the genetic, the spiritual makeup, even in an unregenerate state or unsaved state, still has God's fingerprints on them. So sometimes you just know. You may say, well, I don't, I don't know anything about the scriptures, but I know right from wrong. 
to know that there is right from wrong means that there is someone who has designed the the institution of what is right and also to distinguish that from what is wrong and humans did not come up with what is right or what is wrong originally we follow what is right or we do what is wrong and we have an easier time as humans to do what is wrong versus what is right then of course we have authoritarianism this is definitely a great area and it's one of the areas that's most magnified because this specific area basically points to witnesses okay witnesses and a great cloud of witnesses 500 witnesses the witnesses are the disciples that testified the death burial resurrection of jesus christ there was roman citizens that beheld jesus christ when he um died on the cross these are witnesses they cast out lots you have the scriptures that testify of the witness of jesus christ and of course rationalism we don't have to throw our, our brains out the door the scriptures can make sense and in the moment when paul was talking he was talking back and forth with people who did not believe or even people who did believe but they had questions or they believe the scriptures in error let's go ahead and move on okay so the next particular phase we need to ask ourselves the question as far as authoritarianism now authoritarianism or testimonies are very powerful they're extremely powerful that's the reason why we have reviews that's why we go to amazon or we go to different types of websites and we see these four star reviews so let's say, look at john 19 verse 35 john 19 verse 35 says and he who has seen and has testified has testified and his testimony is true and he knows that he is telling the truth so that you also may believe so this is by going by a testimony and testimonies do not have to be isolated at all they're extremely powerful so that's the reason why the christian faith is is so vast and so large because if it just happened and it was just a a, a, a hoax then this would have been dispelled many 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 years ago it would have been written off many many years ago and so we have to be careful of being woke but still being asleep to the things of god all right so let's go ahead and move on now here's the truth of the matter authoritarianism or testimonies undergirds christianity and these may seem like they're complex but just indulge me for just a moment so let's go ahead and clear this up and let's look at these uh, one by one so in the beginning we need to see that there is number one general revelation right here special revelation and then ontological revelation okay so what are these things all about or basically what they what do they basically mean so from a general revelation standpoint this basically means that people who are on this planet know that there is a god and it is dictated in Romans chapter 1 verse 20. In other words, for the heavens declare the individual attributes of God, the glory of God, so that men are without excuse. You can look at several things that are on this planet that mankind had nothing to do with. So, And even if you wanted to go very technical with it, we know that humans did not create themselves. We're a conduit. We did not invent each other. So how did we get here? We didn't come from out of some primordial soup um, from the ocean like has been purported over the years because there has to be a missing link. There has to be some type of transitional skeleton somewhere, and there has been no transitional skeleton. We're not talking about birth defects either, okay? Then we also have special revelation. This comes from out of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. So special revelation is not for everybody. That's for those that are saved, and this is where the scriptures come into play. So the scriptures, by design, are laced purposely with the fingerprint of God, with the hand hand of God. The word is the word of God. The word or the logos of God became flesh in the person of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, because of his death, burial, resurrection, gave us special revelation in regards to how to interpret and how to grasp from a heart perspective the actual scriptures and then we have ontological revelation it says this in the colossians chapter 1 verse 15 2 and 9 it says he jesus is the image of the invisible god the firstborn of all creation for in him all the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form so ontological revelation basically means that we understand that there is god but god is also manifested in 
three persons. Three persons basically means God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So there is an ontological trinity and then there's an economic trinity. Ontological trinity basically means that Jesus is God and is equal with the Holy Spirit or God is equal to Jesus is equal to the Holy Spirit. There are three, but they express themselves in different manifestations, economically different. So the father is first, then the son was given and then the Holy Spirit was sent. They were not created. They were all there from the beginning, but they but God decided that, hey, I wanted to reveal myself in different ways to people. You can see my glory, but you've never seen me. I'm God because I did not um, because you all really do not know how to approach me. Let me go ahead and set up some artifacts and let me set up a system um, through sacrifices. And this is what was done in the Old Testament for you to be able to communicate with me because I can't communicate with sinful beings. OK, that's not how it's going to work. So I'm going to create a, I'm going to select the people the ancient Hebrews to reveal myself through to the nations. That was the beginning part. But then as time began to go on, um, rules and regulations were really difficult in regards to the things of God. So difficult in that people figured that just because they followed the law, they thought that they had a relationship with God, but you can't, you can follow the law. You could come up with different types of buzzwords when it comes to the things of God, but that does not mean that you have a relationship with God. It's kind of like an unbeliever that says Christianese type things to a person who really has the power of the Holy Spirit within them, thinking that just a, an utterance of words is going to win them over. But no, you can feel somebody else's spirit. And so you can't be fooled just by a Christian speak or just somebody who just spouts off at the Bible. You, they have to be able to live the words that they are saying. And then, of course, we have the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is not less than. It was just sent at a different time, meaning not sent in at a different time as in it was never there before because the Holy Spirit has been there the entire time. It came and left in the Old Testament. That's how people were able to do specific tasks. That's how the anointing was shared upon David when the anointing came upon him at that moment of time. But then it also left. It is there to come help you complete a specific task. But in the New Testament, because of the Holy Spirit that indwells in us, it never leaves. We are always going to be anointed because of the power of God. Now, the true anointing really comes forward whether or not we submit to the Holy Spirit that is on the inside of us to lead us and guide us and direct us. The more you submit to God through the power of the Holy Spirit, the more that God takes over you and he takes over your mind, body, and spirit. And then you become a, um, how should I say, a living vessel for him to work through inside of this world. All right. Let's go ahead and keep on going. We also need to understand that authoritarianism without going through every single slide, is also rejected by um, humanity in general. Basically meaning that there are certain times where sometimes will people, they'll look at, like in this case of Romans chapter 1, verse 25, they could see all of the evidence and they could still deny the power of God, as you can see right here. They can hear the scriptures and we can tell them that the scriptures are, are, are given by God and they're inspired by God, but they will still reject them because they want to have something that suits their own truth. You heard that buzzword really come alive over the last three to five years. And then finally, ontological revelation. This can also be rejected because, as it says in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 8, wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood. For if they understood, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So just because you have worldly wisdom does not mean you have the wisdom of God. So this is where we get into faith and reason or faith versus reason. OK, now when it comes to faith versus reason, there's a couple of other things that we need. We also need to um, basically understand as we move into our final phase. Let's ask a couple of questions. Isn't the faith opposite of facts, reason and evidence? Isn't that the case? Well, not necessarily. Faith actually encompasses all of those specific things. So let's look at what Nietzsche said on faith. Nietzsche said, when faith is thus exalted above everything else, it necessarily follows that reason, knowledge, and patient inquiry have to be discredited. The road to truth becomes a forbidden road. Faith means not wanting to know what is true. But I could tell you that that is not 
further from the truth. That is basically how some people actually view the actual scriptures and view the uh, underpinnings of faith. Now, Nietzsche is actually a very important figure because Nietzsche has been the father of what we see um, in many of our politics for today as far as how they see the world through a secular lens. Okay, let's go ahead and keep on going. So what Rabbi Zacharias, God rest his soul, he says the following, he says, what I believe in my heart must make sense in my mind. Doesn't that, isn't that wonderful? So once again, you do not have to put your faith at the door. How about Thomas Aquinas, brilliant man of God? He said, faith signifies the assent of the intellect to that which is believed. So you can't just stay just with head knowledge only. That's not the only, um, that's not the only way. That's why it kind of uh, grieves me at times when people go back and forth on Facebook um, about um, certain things dealing with God. Um, we There was a specific topic that was brought up today by one of my Facebook friends about sea lining. And sea lining is when you get a barrage of questions from somebody who does not want to learn. <laughs> That's what sea lining is. It's a barrage of questions that you receive from somebody who does not want to learn anything. They're not asking in order to get down to the root of your belief system. They are trying to ask you questions in order to overwhelm your faith system or your belief system to create doubt. So they're not coming to learn as opposed to somebody who's truly inquisitive like one of the um, um, young rulers that approached Jesus and he said to him, you know, good teacher, you know, tell me about, you know, the Ten Commandments and he started telling about the Two Commandments and all these other different types of things and he says, okay, well, you're not far from the kingdom because he really was getting very close to the things of God and who knows if that uh, first former Pharisee um, got saved later on because he was very close and Jesus says you almost um, are, are you not too far from the kingdom of God in other words you understand the scriptures you really get to the essence and we almost broke through that religious spirit but not too many far days ahead my hope and my prayer even with that ancient example that that person who was not too far from the kingdom really got saved and so faith signifies the ascent of the intellect that is or the, to that which is belief. Now, if this can be accompanied by doubt and fear of the opposite side, there will be opinion. While if there be certainty and no fear of the other side, there will be faith. So faith is the opposite of fear. And faith and opinion actually differ because opinions change all over the place. They're very temporary in nature and they are sometimes based solely on how we feel, feel especially if it's in the bubble of a worldview. But faith goes beyond that. Okay, faith has no fear. This is ah, well, this is how I feel about the specific topic versus I have faith that this is going to come to pass. Not because of something that I just came up with, but because God told me so, or I trust his word. God doesn't lie. People do. Okay, so let's go ahead and finish on up here. So this is how the Bible basically defines faith or basically gets faith. And it comes from out of Hebrews chapter 11, verse one. It says, now faith, I love that, is the what? It is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, not seen. Okay, and that's in Hebrews 11, verse 1. Let's keep on going on. Now, when we look at the word pistis, this basically means in the Greek, the state of believing on the basis of reliability of the one, watch this, trusted. Who can be trusted? Well, yeah, you could trust me to a certain extent as a human, but I know someone that can truly be trusted in, in context according to the word of God. This is talking about the embodiment of trust himself, which is Lord Jehovah, God, in the person of Jesus Christ. He can be trusted. We can have confidence in him. We can rely on him and he will not lie to us. Again, we can trust him. We can have confidence in him. We can rely on him and he will not lie to us. He keeps his promise. Okay. There is also another Greek term that's called um, nomizo, which basically means believing something because of family tradition. Another word for this is the law of first truth. It is never used in the first uh, in the New Testament. It's never used in the Christian faith. Pistis is the only Greek term used for faith in the New Testament. So now we know exactly the context of what it is. 
the atheistic comp, um, basically component of blind faith or faith without any residence or even is foreign to the New Testament. So you're not just supposed to believe in stuff just cause or believe in God without any evidence. No, there's evidence that backs up these specific things. And it's not just about archaeology or it's not just based off of how I feel. There's other areas of ways that you can arrive to um, the truth of God. And when you get saved, all four of those areas come alive. You may... Um, be revealed or God may reveal himself through one of those four ways. But then once he does, all of those ways are basically amplified in your spirit. Okay. Coming around the mountain here. So that is pistis, a beautiful thing. So how about this? Okay, let's look at this. Once again, talk about blind faith in Christianity, not according to the writings of the Apostle Paul, he says, for if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised, and if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then those who also have fallen asleep in Christ, those who are saved and now have gone on, have perished. If we have hoped in Christ, in this life only, we are of all men to be pitied, or above all men to be most miserable. In other words, faith in Christ rests upon the evidence, watch this, because of, upon the evidence for his res resurrection. This is the bottom line key in regards to faith in Jesus Christ. And this is how Christianity can be falsified. Okay? So if there was no resurrection, then we are still yet in our sins. And if we are still in our sins, we above all men are most miserable. So as we come conclude and as we come around the mountain and into the driveway and get ready to turn off our keys, we need to understand the same um, element. You know, once again, how can we believe in anything at all? So here's a couple of questions that I have for you, oh great listener and watcher. Number one, a person should believe in something if that something is true, correct? Well, let's look into it. Here's a couple of questions. If atheism is true, then everyone should be atheists, right? If Islam is true, then everyone should be Muslims. But if Christianity is true, shouldn't everyone be Christians? That's like a line of questioning, right? Right? But let's look at this. And I call this, um, this as, you know what this is? This is an example of subjectivity, okay? So, Soren right there, Soren Kierkegaard, you see him right there? <laughs> Soren Kierkegaard basically says, he says this as the following. He says, Kierkegaard was not espousing relative truth, but calling all people to commit themselves to the truth. So he was basically given a rhetorical question. Truth has an existential bearing on the life of the one who commits to it. Existential means outside of yourself. It is transcendent in nature. It's not bound to just your bubble or how you were raised and where you came from. Not at all. He also knew that the Bible or biblical truths were easy to understand in theory, but difficult to understand in practice because the latter requires obedience. Oh, my goodness. Can I amplify that several times over? The latter requires obedience. Let me see if I could go ahead and pull this out a little bit. I like to I like to um, choose and I like my little toys that I can also bring out as well. So you see how that's amplified right there. This is the amplified Bible. It requires obedience. That is the absolute formula right there. Faith and obedience is important. So, yeah, you can understand the scriptures, but the Bible says be not only hearers of the word or watchers of the word or uh, streaming consumers of the word, but also do the word. That's what separates a true Christian from just somebody who is, you know, a nominal Christian or a Christian, you know, by proxy or from a cultural standpoint. Okay. So, as we conclude, why is Christianity or the Christian faith worthy of belief? Now, for all my people who say I'm, I want to dispel religion and um, I want a religion in our relationship, um, I want a, a relationship and not religion, um, the Christian faith is a religion, but it's a religion that's based out of love, love for one another and love of God. What else is there? That is what the religion basically represents. And good religion, as it says in John chapter 1, verse 27, is basically feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting the widows, the jailhouses, and prisons, giving to those in need, giving of yourself. It's a selfless uh, system. 
And it's not based on our righteousness, the reason why we do these things or the reason why we accept it because of God is because of his righteousness. That is the reason why we can follow the things of God. So once again, as we conclude, let's go ahead and dig into it during our final moments together. The reason why your Christian faith is worthy of belief is because, number one, let's go ahead and hit it together, because it is logically consistent. Okay? It is logically consistent. So that's number one. It is logically consistent. It has no contradictory teasing, teaching. In other words, rationalism, but not omitting revelation. Okay? Now, some people will say that, hey, the scriptures contradict each other. That's because of lack of understanding and because of not reading or being taught the scriptures in their proper context. Okay? So it's logically consistent, meaning that it's worthy of belief because the Bible makes sense. It gives answers to things that we really, um, <clears throat> it gives answers to things that we really have a lot of questions about, like sin, good, and evil. A lot of the transcendent things that we have been given by God to, um, actually distinguish us um, as different from the average uh, faith system or something that was created by man that was out there. Okay. How about the next one? It is also empirically verifiable. In other words, there is actual evidence to this. You see that? It is actual evidence to this. In other words, the biblical faith, the Christian faith is grounded in space, time, history, and reasonable to hold given the intrinsic nature of the world around us. In other words, just look at, look outside. Look at how a tree grows. Look at how beautiful a flower is. Look at how animals interact with each other. My wife and I, we have two, uh, two new kids in our house, and these are parakeets. One of them is called Turks, and the other one is called Caicos. And we look at those birds, and we're just amazed at how beautiful they are and how simple they are and how they can move on their own without any batteries. And it's just a beautiful phenomenon. And then I look at the birds and I see how drastically different those birds are as compared to myself. So we are the made in the image and likeness of God, not a bird. But then you have some situations where people begin to worship animals and begin to elevate them to a position that they're not even worthy of holding. Okay, they're pets, they're animals, they are part of God's creation. But we shouldn't worship the creation more than the creator. It also is existentially, existentially relevant, okay? No other system adequately explains the world as it exists and provides objective grounds for morality than the Christian faith. In other words, the Bible has clear examples as to the reason why there is right from wrong and the reason why there is a moral law. There is a moral law which is innate inside of ourselves because there is a moral law giver. There was no Bible when Adam and Eve were around. The Bible just speaks of, about Adam and Eve, but God spoke to them one-on-one. -on -one. There would be no need for scriptures if man did not sin. I'm just saying. So if we would have stayed in right relationship with God, we wouldn't be in the situation that we're in. But that hindsight is 2020, right? Oh goodness, 2020. <sighs> but even in the midst of being able to see things backwards, God has given us special revelation through his son, Jesus Christ. And that's where we get into the life-changing and personal aspect of the word. It is life-changing and personal. In other words, it alters human character and carries with it the in internal witness of God's Holy Spirit. This is experience. Okay. So you see all of these different things about rational that makes sense. There's data. You get the feeling element along with the data. And then of course, you get the experience. The experience truly comes through a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. And like I said, you see this part right here? It says human character and it, it alters human character. Let me go ahead and erase that or not. It basically alters human character completely. Okay. It alters human character. In other words, I was once lost, but now I'm found. I was once blind, but now I see. I was once um, a sinner that was on the way to hell. Now I'm I'm a sinner saved by grace. Before meeting Jesus Christ, I loved sin and I did not feel about bad about committing sin. But now as a person who is saved through the power of Jesus Christ, I have additional power to say no to sin. Whereas before I could not say no to sin 
um, very easily, if at all. And then finally, the scriptures are trustworthy. The faith, the Christian faith is trustworthy in testimony. It supplies strong reasons. Here it is. It supplies strong reasons for believing those who testify of its truth. Just want to make sure that you get this whole list on out there. And let's pause it right there. Once again, it is trustworthy in testimony. A great cloud of witnesses. 500 plus people saw Jesus in his glorified um, body or see Jesus in his resurrected body um, after he rose again. That is the bedrock of the Christian faith. And they have been trying for the last 2,000 plus years to try to upend that specific fact. And these things are definitely consistent. So, of course, there is a lot of other things, a lot of resources that are out there that you can basically look at. In regards to the faith, different types of resources. But again, I'm just so thankful to God that we were able to get through the specific teaching. I'm so thankful to God that we were able to really get some good questions um, um, out, out there, get you just thinking about specific things. Now, once again, the reason why I um, chose to teach this class over um, a, a period of, of two times, of course, or two-part series is because we have a lot of people in this world that have trouble getting to the truth and to the truth of God's word and the truth of who he is. There's a lot of stumbling blocks in the way. There's a lot of distractions in the way. And so my desire was to kind of cut to the chase and try to give you some knowledge as to ways that a person can arrive at the truth, maybe even differently that you would. Be, or you would be accustomed to all right well god bless you god keep you i got a football game to go to uh, my son is playing tonight for the haggerty huskies and i'm definitely looking forward to that especially as a former football player myself can't you see can't you see my head my head looks like a knock never mind it looks like it knock over a couple of people all right well anyway that was back in the day not right now if i got hit on the football field i'd probably be dizzy 15 times over all right so once again god bless you god keep you this is our um, um bible teaching series on this Wednesday, okay? This will also be replaying later on this evening at 7 o'clock p.m. as a replay. God bless you. God keep you. Don't forget um, our services, once again, are 1030 a.m. on Sunday mornings. And, of course, we're going to be streaming live on Wednesday nights, probably for the foreseeable future, okay? Now, of course, as demand change and as things change in our society, then we'll come back face-to-face. -face, but I want to try to be as responsible as possible. And also, Bible studies on Wednesday nights have changed in nature. So I still wanted to be able to speak to you through this new platform of social media. Also, don't forget, let your line, light shine bright. Um, our space is filling up as things are starting to get back um, to some sense of normalcy. Um, our daycare is filling up. More people are working. More people are getting called back to work. We have a system in place. And now we're just waiting for the vaccine or other different types of therapeutics so this virus will eventually go away and i believe that it will okay through immunity through other different ways so once again consider our daycare our telephone number for the daycare is 407-807-0701 lady martin is the owner the brainchild of the daycare once again check us out we will take care of your kids great got a great reputation in the community and we teach the word of god and display the word of god before our little ones and then finally don't forget our Thanksgiving drive through food drive. This is also a very important endeavor as we begin to move forward. It is truly a blessing. And so don't forget, make sure that you come out for that, especially if you need turkeys. Once again, um, the food giveaway is not just about turkeys only. Those are based, based off of registration. It's primarily really about us giving away food to the community. And we're going to try to feed several hundred families on that specific day. And once again, that is on November the 7th from... 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. It's going to be first come, first serve. We're also going to be working with um, the people in the area as well as Castleberry Police Department to make sure that traffic is not overwhelming <laughs> like it was for our back to school bash. But I was just so thankful to God that we were able to do that. OK, so we're getting ready to gear up and serve once again. Once again, everybody, let's go ahead and close this thing out in prayer. I'm just so thankful to God for that. I'm thankful to God for how he has um, touched us and how we're able to been able to do a lot of things lately so let's go ahead and pray lord god i just thank you i bless you 
I honor you. I thank you, Lord God, for um, allowing for us to be able to come into your presence once again. I thank you, Lord God, for these, your people. I thank you, Lord God, for, you know, just allowing for us to be able to make it through all of these many months despite the pandemic, despite everything that's going on in the world, the political unrest, the geopolitical unrest, Lord God, through financial stress and strain. There's a lot of people that are hurting. There's a lot of people who are worrying. There's a lot of people who are feeling detached from the house of God, from the people of God, and from you, Lord God. Lord God, reconnect them. Restore their passion for you once again, Lord God, and let them know that there are people that care about them, that there is a God, a God distinctly through the person of Jesus Christ that loves them like no other. And finally, Heavenly Father, I pray right now, if there's someone that does not know you, that does not know or have a relationship with you, that you that they understand and know that you came, died, and was buried and rose again on the third day. And that now that you sit at the right hand of the Father. I'm speaking specifically of Jesus Christ. If they do not know Jesus Christ, may they come into full knowledge of your Son at this moment in time. So they also may too, like myself so many years ago, have a life-altering, a life-changing experience by coming in contact with you. May they be filled with the Holy Spirit. May they understand and know who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, family, that's it. Once again, I'm out of time, but not out of message. I sure like to talk. No, I really like to talk. I really like to communicate with each and every one of you. Once again, don't forget about our services, 1030 a.m. on Sunday morning. Bring a friend. You can do it responsibly. Bring a mask. Do so responsibly. We've had very, very few. We've had a very little impact of any of the coronavirus for our congregation. That is a miracle in and of itself. And we just want to keep on serving and keep on loving God. We're not special. We're not different. We're not better than anybody else. The only thing that I can say is that we love God and love people. Be blessed, everybody. See you later.